The story begins on the 14th birthday of the protagonist, Chen. On that evening, there was continuous heavy rain. Chen's father was teaching him how to achieve a wonderful life. He told Chen to wholeheartedly devote himself to something he loves, while outside, the lightning and thunder continued. Suddenly, a ball of lightning the size of a basketball, emitting red light, passed through closed doors and windows like a ghost. It first touched Chen's mother, and she instinctively grabbed her father. In an instant, both of them turned into ashes. It took Chen a long time to believe that it was a reality, and not a dream. This is because even in a crematorium, to completely turn a human body into ashes, it needs to be burned at a temperature of 2000 degrees for 30 minutes. Since then, Chin decided to research this strange phenomenon and immersed himself in the study. Chin worked hard to achieve his goals. After successfully getting into his dream university, he continued to study diligently in the library, reading about differential equations into the early hours of the morning. During this process, there was a beautiful girl named Dylan in the library who had been staring at him for a long time and praised him, saying, you are special. I feel that you have a strong sense of purpose, as if you're looking for something. This girl was very perceptive. Even though she took the initiative to strike up a conversation with him, Chen walked away without turning his head. Since Chen started paying attention to this ball lightning, a series of unexplainable and bizarre phenomena began to occur. In his second year of college, when Chen returned home, he found the house to be unexpectedly clean. There was only a thin layer of dust on everything, including the mirrors and tables, and he was certain that nobody had visited. The doors and windows were securely locked. Even more strangely, in a landscape painting by his father, a water tower suddenly appeared. This water tower was built only after Chen had gone to college. Moreover, there were a few long white hairs by the wash basin. Chen was very shocked. At this moment, it was another rainy night with lightning and thunder. The next day, Chen left home and decided never to return. Chen returned to his exploratory path. He was admitted to graduate school and studied under a mentor named Zhang Bin, who had a slight limp. This mentor came across as very rigid and was not interested in matters related to ball lightning. He only cared about practical and current matters. One of his graduate students, Zhao Yu, once said that if a key fell to the ground, Zhang Bin wouldn't follow the direction of the sound it made but instead, he'd use a ruler and chalk to mark a grid on the entire floor of the room and then search grid by grid. According to Zhao Yu, Zhang Bin had also developed a lightning-resistant coating to apply to high-voltage lines, eliminating the need for lightning rods. However, the cost of large-scale implementation was even higher than that of lightning rods, making it practically useless. During Chen's two years of graduate studies, he learned that Zhang Bin's wife had passed away at a young age, perhaps explaining his personality. As Chen neared the end of his graduate studies, Zhang Bin gave him a piece of advice. Young people shouldn't be enthusiastic about vague and elusive things. Later, Chen worked hard and was admitted to a PhD program, studying under a mentor named Gao Bo, who had graduated from MIT. This mentor was more open-minded and allowed Chen to research ball lightning. Chen suddenly remembered that Zhang Bin had mentioned atmospheric researchers witnessing ball lightning on Mount Tai. So, Chen went to Mount Tai. While ascending the mountain, Chen brushed past a girl wearing a white shirt and jeans, leaving a deep impression on him. At the mountain summit, Chen encountered Zhao Yu, who was now the deputy station chief at the Mount Tai weather station. During dinner, they heard an elderly cook talk about witnessing ball lightning in 1962. That night, there was a four-person research team at the weather station, and one of them was struck by lightning severely injuring one of his legs. He saw a pancake-sized, blood-red ball of lightning pass through closed doors and windows, disappearing into the smoke before exploding. From that moment, this person decided to make the creation of ball lightning his lifelong goal. Chin was shocked to learn that this person was his mentor, Zhang Bin. The following day on Mount Tai, it was raining, and Chin once again encountered the girl he had seen before. They struck up a conversation. Her name was Lin Yun, a doctoral student specializing in anti-aircraft weapons at the National University of Defense Technology. She had climbed the mountain for observational research on artificially creating lightning. As their conversation deepened, Chen revealed his childhood experiences to someone for the first time. That day, they became friends. In the two years after returning from Mount Tai to school, with the help of his mentor Gao Bo, Chen developed a mathematical model for ball lightning and successfully defended his PhD thesis. Chen became Dr. Chen. As he was about to graduate, Chen finally went to see his teacher, Zhang Bin. Zhang Bin had previously opposed Chen's choice of ball lightning as his thesis topic. When they met, Zhang Bin didn't answer Chen's questions and instead hung his head low. After a long pause, he slowly stood up and opened a door to reveal a room filled with Zhang Bin's notes on ball lightning. Then, Zhang Bin began to share his own past. After returning from Mount Tai, he had also started researching ball lightning. He met another female researcher who was studying ball lightning, and they got married. For 10 years, they chased ball lightning together in thunderstorms. Later, Zhang Bin's wife saw ball lightning on her own and died while trying to measure it, burned to ashes, just like Chen's parents. 
John Bin candidly admitted that he had spent nearly his entire life without unraveling the mystery. So, he had intentionally discouraged Chen from pursuing it. After recounting his story, John Bin gave Chen a notebook that had survived the fire when his wife passed away. Chen opened the notebook and discovered that some pages were burned while others remained intact, without consecutive pages being damaged. John Bin revealed that he had never shown this notebook to anyone because nobody believed it was real and would think it was forged. Finally, John Bin shared all his research materials on ball lightning with Chen, who, as a sign of respect, requested to scan a photo of Zhang Bin's wife to ensure people knew she was the first to directly measure ball lightning. In Chen's research materials, he found that the mathematical model he had struggled to create had already been developed by Zhang Bin over a decade ago, and Zhang Bin had rejected this model in the conclusion. Zhang Bin's notes included several mathematical models more intricate than the one Chen had created, which Zhang Bin had also disavowed. Just before leaving the school, something strange happened. One night, in an empty dormitory, Chen heard a sigh, even though the school had been on vacation for a long time. Suddenly, he saw a ghostly white figure flash through the dark night. This startled Chen, and to distract himself, he began reading Zhang Bin's papers. While going through the papers, he came across notes left by Zhang Bin's wife, dated 12 years after her death. Chen quickly searched through Zhang Bin's notes, and found five notes written by her many years after her death. This left Chen stunned, and he promptly closed his computer. After leaving school, Chen became a colleague of his doctoral advisor, Gao Bo. To secure research funding, Gao Bo sent Chen to the new Concept Weapon Development Center at the National University of Defense Technology. Chen remembered Lin Yun, who worked there, and he encountered her in military attire. Lin Yun was delighted to see Chen, and she explained what new concept weapons were, such as birds carrying small bombs and cockroaches with corrosive liquid sacs. She then took Chen from the office building to the experimental site. In the car, Chen caught a whiff of Lin Yun's perfume, and he instinctively sniffed it slightly. Lin Yun noticed Chen's gesture and asked with a smile if he liked the perfume. Chen replied awkwardly and quickly changed the topic to a small ornament hanging in the car, which was a piece of bamboo. Lin Yun explained that it was a small landmine, a type that had been collected from battlefields in Guangxi, China, in the 1980s. These mines contained very little metal, making them undetectable by standard mine detectors. They didn't need to be buried, just scattered on the ground. Although they wouldn't kill people, they could easily blow off a foot. In terms of reducing enemy combat capability, these injury-causing weapons were more efficient than lethal ones. When Qin found the bamboo ornament scary, Lin Yun looked at the small landmine with appreciation, as if admiring it. Not long after, the car drove into a heavily guarded base, and Lin Yun and Qin were greeted by Air Force Colonel Su Wenqing. His attitude towards Lin Yun during their conversation made Qin believe that Lin Yun was far from an ordinary major. Lin Yun wanted to show Qin their research achievements, which included an airborne ground target lightning project. By using superconductive batteries, helicopters could release lightning from the sky to strike an oil barrel target. However, there were several flaws in this project. The first was the limited range, the second was the constraint of onboard power, and the third was the requirement that the target had to be electrified, rendering it of little practical value. Afterward, Lin Yun demonstrated an atmospheric lightning creation model experiment in a spacious warehouse, simulating lightning generated in the atmosphere. The model obliterated an aircraft model passing through it. However, Lin Yun indicated that this project had also failed due to the uncontrollability of the real atmospheric environment. Floating electric fields had resulted in the loss of a pilot's life. After the visit, Chen's aversion to weapons and slaughter increased significantly, and it reminded him of the rainy night when he lost his parents. But at that moment, Lin Yun requested Chen's participation in their plan to turn ball lightning into a weapon. Chen thought, have you ever seen ball lightning kill someone? I have. He had shared his past with Lin Yun on top of Mount Tai two years ago, but it had inspired her. Despite Chen's opposition, he believed that expressing his disapproval would be enough to dissuade Lin Yun. However, the next day, Chen realized he had underestimated Lin Yun's capabilities. When Lin Yun visited Chen's dormitory, it took only two reasons to change Chen's mind. The first reason was that throughout history, significant scientific advancements had almost always resulted from the joint efforts of scientists and the military. The second and most crucial point was that the primary target of lightning weapons was not humanity but electronic systems. Thus, ball lightning could potentially be a weapon that ended wars with minimal damage. In the end, Lin Yun aptly pointed out that, as the lifelong pursuit of Qin, a weapon system was currently the only possible application for ball lightning. So, Lin Yun successfully convinced Chen and invited him to dinner. At the restaurant, driven by curiosity, Lin Yun removed one of her brooches and effortlessly cut a pair of metal utensils into two pieces, just like the small landmine in the car. Even a small brooch was a dangerous weapon. After that evening's dinner, Chen and Lin Yun joined forces to research ball lightning. During this process, Chen slowly realized that the mathematical model for ball lightning was too complex for computers to handle. 
To address this, Lin Yun hacked into a website named In Search of Extraterrestrials from her home. She uploaded the data she needed to the server of the other party, causing a large number of computers downloading their program to work for the research group. Chin discovered that when a person desires something deeply, moral constraints become powerless. Chin did not oppose this action, and Lin Yun had fewer moral constraints than he did. However, on the eighth day of successful data collection, the website sent a reprimand and cut off the research group's data. Just when Chin was at a loss, a message appeared online with the content. I know what you're calculating, BL, don't waste your time, come find me. It was from the Russian Federation, Information Polyarni. The message even provided a detailed address. Taking advantage of an opportunity to negotiate with a Russian military delegation, Lin Yun and Chin traveled to Novosibirsk in Siberia. They reached the address given in the message. However, as they were parting ways, the driver uttered a phrase, this is the cheapest residential area in the city, but it doesn't house the cheapest people. This remark left Chen feeling quite uneasy. When Lin Yun and Chen met this mysterious man, they realized that the driver's words were not unfounded. The man's full name was Alexander Gamov, and his house was adorned with numerous photographs of ball lightning, all taken at different locations. The three of them engaged in a relatively enjoyable conversation. In the end, this Russian man brought them to the world's largest ball lightning research facility. This place had been abandoned for many years due to its classified nature, and the entrance had been sealed. Gamov, having secretly dug a tunnel, led them inside. He explained that more than 40 years ago, over 5,000 people had worked there to study ball lightning under Project 3141. They conducted tens of thousands of experiments over 30 years and successfully produced 27 ball lightnings. However, each occurrence was random, entirely irreproducible and uncontrollable. During that time, Gamov was also framed by a colleague, sentenced to 20 years in prison. Even though he could continue working at the research base as a lightning designer, his wife succumbed to an extended illness caused by radiation, and his son was killed by ball lightning. He had dedicated his entire life to ball lightning, and in the end, all he received was failure and the destruction of his family. Gamov advised them to do something meaningful while they were still young and not waste their time on something elusive. As a result of Gamov's guidance, Chen recalled his mentor, Zhang Bin, his wife Zhang Min, and Gamov. Their experiences convinced him to abandon ball lightning research and return to a normal life. However, he knew that an invitation by phone could change everything again. The invitation was from Jiang Xingchen, the captain of China's aircraft carrier, the peak of Mount Everest. He was also Lin Yun's fiancé. Chin did not refuse and went to the appointment. They sailed together and reached a deserted island. As they watched a water spout on the sea, they marveled at the power of natural creation. But Jiang Xingchen criticized the rigid Russian weapon research mechanism. He also expressed concerns about Lin Yun's obsession with weapons, which had significantly impacted her. Lin Yun had invented a liquid landmine that appeared colorless and transparent but was actually nitroglycerin modified by nanotechnology. When she proposed this mine to her superiors, she faced severe criticism as China had already joined the International Landmine Treaty. However, not long ago, this mine appeared in the conflict between Chile and Bolivia on the Atacama border. What was more terrifying was that both hostile sides used it. After the conversation with Jiang Xingqin, Chun couldn't sleep. He observed the lighthouse outside, which would periodically turn on and off. Recalling the water spout from earlier in the day, he suddenly had an epiphany. Perhaps ball lightning was like the lighthouse he saw outside, it had always been there, but people could only see it when it was active. So, Chen's new goal wasn't to create ball lightning but to find unactivated ball lightning in nature. He immediately went to find Lin Yun, and Chen was also invited to Lin Yun's house as a guest. At her home, Chen discovered that Lin Yun had an impressive level of determination, much of which was attributed to her father, Lin Feng. He was a military leader, strict but approachable. Chen shared his newfound insights with them. He explained that the 27 ball lightnings created by the Soviets were not products of their experiments, but were inherent in the environment. Their experiments had accidentally activated them. Therefore, the research team needed to create a sufficiently large electrical network to simultaneously activate the ball lightning in a large area. However, even using the previously researched superconductive batteries for power, covering a sufficient area required a substantial budget. Faced with this challenge, Lin Feng, who had an engineering background, proposed a solution. He compared it to fishing, saying that you didn't need to cast nets everywhere in a river to catch fish. Similarly, for a large-scale ball lightning formation, they didn't need to cover the entire area with batteries. They could use two helicopters to create an electric arc and skin it uniformly. This method would require fewer superconductive batteries and helicopters. Lin Yun named this creative plan Skynet. Seeing Lin Yun's happiness, Lin Feng felt worried. After dinner, he had a private conversation with Chen and revealed the tragic past of Lin Yun's mother. She served as the communications platoon leader in a unit on the front lines of the conflict between Yunnan and Vietnam during the socialist era in the 1980s. 
Her team was ambushed while trying to repair a communication line. All of her comrades died, leaving only Lin Yun's mother and a female soldier. The female soldier was about to reconnect a line when she encountered a segment of bamboo, which exploded when she tried to remove it. After the explosion, Lin Yun's mother resumed her work, but suddenly a swarm of wasps attacked her. Although she jumped into a small pond to escape, the wasps continued to hover above the pond. With the front lines in intense combat, every minute of communication downtime could result in substantial losses. Eventually, she disregarded the wasps and climbed out of the pond, returning to the connection point to restore the communication line. However, she paid a heavy price as she was stung countless times by the wasps. A week later, Lin Yun's mother succumbed to the poisoning, experiencing a painful death. Sharing this tragic story, Lin Feng expressed how different children could have opposite reactions to such experiences. They could grow to abhor everything related to war for their entire lives, or they could become dedicated, or even passionate, about such matters. Unfortunately, Lin Yun, who was only five years old at the time, belonged to the latter category. In their final words, Lin Feng earnestly asked him to supervise Lin Yun during the Ball Lightning Project. Later, the Skynet project began. However, during its maiden flight, an electric arc struck the tail rotor of one helicopter, almost causing it to crash. To prevent further accidents, an effective lightning protection measure was necessary. At this moment, Chen remembered Zhang Bin's lightning-resistant coating. They reached out to Zhang Bin, who was suffering from leukemia at the time. Despite his illness, he agreed to participate in the ball lightning detection project with his lightning-resistant coating. Two days later, two helicopters coated with lightning-resistant paint were sent into the sky, spreading an electric network across an area 100 times larger than the Soviet experimental base. After half an hour with no findings, disappointment began to set in. However, just as they were about to lose hope, the pilots reported sighting the target. And so, after 30 years for Zhang Ben and 13 years for Chen, they once again witnessed a ball lightning. This particular ball lightning appeared orange-red and dragged a relatively short tail across the night sky for about a minute before disappearing. Throughout that night, they managed to detect three ball lightnings. Under the brilliant starry sky, Zhang Bin expressed that he had no more regrets in this lifetime. The next step for the research team was to identify the properties of the ball lightning. However, a mishap occurred during the following operation. A ball lightning exploded in front of a helicopter, but fortunately, the pilot managed to eject in time. Strangely, the explosion left the pilot's fingernails burned to a pale gray color. This major incident pushed the research into another crisis and they decided to invite one of the foremost figures in modern physics, scientist Ding Yi, who was considered one of the highest authorities in domestic fundamental sciences. Though he had a strong personality, and initially declined the research team's invitation, he eventually agreed to participate when he learned that ball lightning was a product of some unknown structure triggered by lightning itself. When Professor Ding Yi arrived at the research space, he was known for his startling statements. He first proposed that ball lightning was a visible transparent sphere, a circular void brought into view due to the bending of light resembling a soap bubble. This led to a spirited debate with several top pilots who couldn't perceive such voids with the naked eye. Ding Yi questioned their vision. To prove his point, Ding Yi suggested that they capture a ball lightning and release it for everyone to see. To facilitate Ding Yi's plan, Lin Yun borrowed a missile defense system that resembled a fishing rod from a tank base. She revealed her plan, which involved using an arc to excite ball lightning, immediately followed by extending a pole with a superconducting wire to the point where the ball lightning disappeared. The other end of the wire was connected to a cabin full of superconducting batteries. Although many people opposed the idea, Lin Yun leveraged her privilege to get approval from Air Force Colonel Su Wenqing. The next day, the experiment to capture ball lightning began. Lin Yun boarded the helicopter with the capture system. After 24 minutes of flight, a ball lightning was activated, and then the electric arc extinguished. In the instant the light of the ball lightning disappeared, the pole, tethered to the wire, quickly extended. Accompanying this was a strange, thunderous noise near Lin Yun and it seemed like something exploded in the cabin. However, the helicopter safely landed with the superconducting batteries. The explosion was due to a bottle of mineral water, which had absorbed the energy released by the ball lightning, turning the water into overheated steam. The pilot remarked that they were lucky the helicopter used cooling oil, as otherwise, it could have turned into a bomb. But Dingy added, you're missing the bigger stroke of luck here. Apart from the bottle of mineral water, there's also your blood. The realization struck the group as they imagined their blood instantly turning into overheated steam. When Ding Yi switched on the superconducting batteries, everyone was surprised that nothing appeared to happen. But amidst the laughter and cheer, Ding Yi calmly raised the prop he had with him, a goat board. As the black and white squares were slowly moved into place behind the magnetic field device, the area on the board began to deform. The deformed region clearly outlined a circular shape, like a transparent crystal ball in front of the goat board. The crowd erupted in applause because they had witnessed the bubble of an unexcited ball lightning with their naked eyes. To celebrate the successful experiment, Everyone went to a nearby meadow to roast the whole lamb. 
It was here that Dingy revealed the true nature of ball lightning, macroelectron. He explained that shortly after the Big Bang, space was smooth, but as energy levels decreased, the universe began to fold, giving rise to various elementary particles. Previously, it was believed that these particles only existed on a microscopic scale. Dingy argued that there are also macro-scale elementary particles, like ball lightning. The process where voids are excited into ball lightning and then revert to voids is akin to the electronic transition from a low-energy state to a high-energy state and back in the case of electrons. Among the known neutron, electron, and proton, only electrons can be excited in this way, which is why he referred to them as macro-electrons. This led to the inference that the universe might also contain macro-atoms, macro-matter, and perhaps even an entire macro-world. After the meal on the meadow, Ding Yi and Lin Yun grew close. Chin knew that there would be no outcome between Lin Yun and Ding Yi, but rather, there were two people standing between Lin Yun and himself, Jiang Xingqin and Ding Yi. Shortly after that, during a research discussion, they concluded that understanding the true nature of ball lightning did not necessarily mean having it as a weapon. To capture a large number of macroelectrons for further weapon research, Lin Yun designed an atmospheric optical detection system that successfully located unexcited macroelectrons. Alongside this, they used the superconducting wire aerial net, an upgrade from the capture pole. Once the method of capturing voids was perfected and a sufficient number of macroelectrons were obtained, the research team began to analyze their properties. For this purpose, the team designed a ball lightning excitation device and used a high-speed camera to capture the entire process of ball lightning energy release. In the first 10 seconds of the slow motion video, as the brightness of the ball lightning rapidly increased, the wooden blocks used as targets lost their color and became transparent. Finally, the wooden blocks appeared as mere cubic outlines, almost invisible. When the brightness of the ball lightning reached its maximum, that outline disappeared completely. For five seconds, there was nothing in the area, and then the outline started to reappear, quickly acquiring color and becoming a solid, though now a gray, cubic shape. At this moment, the ball lightning had completely extinguished. Dingy explained that what they had just witnessed was the wave-particle duality of matter. In that brief moment, both the void and the wooden block exhibited wave-like properties. They resonated and merged into one entity. The wave of the wooden block absorbed the energy released by the macro-electron wave, and then they both reverted to particle-like properties. The burned wooden block returned to its original position and became a solid again. The selective nature of ball lightning towards its targets became clearer during a series of live animal experiments. Some macro-electrons released energy that specifically burned the skeletons of animals, while others vaporized the animal's blood. The animals subjected to this attack suffered horrific deaths. Dingy then made a breakthrough, ending these nightmarish experiments. He discovered that when microwaves pass through macro-electrons, different macro-electrons modulated distinct spectra, similar to their fingerprints. At this point, the research team had successfully categorized macro-electrons according to their target attributes. With the optimized excitation devices, they created the world's first set of ball lightning weapons called Thunderball Laser Guns. Not long after, a ball lightning weapon unit was established under the code name Chengwang, led by Commander Kong Ming, a lieutenant colonel. They achieved almost 100% accuracy in practical target shooting. However, the joy of their success didn't last long. One day, Dingy arrived at the target range for observation and pointed out that the necessary condition for stable flight of ball lightning was an observer. As far back as the early 19th century, quantum effects had been confirmed in the microcosmic world. Now, macroelectrons forming ball lightning exhibited macroscale quantum effects. Just like Schrodinger's cat, when there was an observer, their state collapsed to a definite value, leading to precise hits on the target. Without an observer, the ball lightning existed in a quantum state, and everything was uncertain. In such a state, ball lightning was essentially a cloud of electron probabilities, and hitting a target was only a minuscule probability. This explained why in many historical accounts of ball lightning sightings, they had appeared and disappeared mysteriously. The presence of an observer, even unintentionally, caused the macroelectrons to collapse into a visible object. In the following target shooting experiments, Dingy proved his point. When all personnel present closed their eyes and turned off the cameras, the results were off target 9 out of 10 times for 10 consecutive shots, continuing for 2 days. It wasn't until the third day, after confirming the absence of an observer on the scene, that all the ball lightning shots hit the targets. This left the team skeptical of Ding Yi, who strongly insisted on immediately stopping the experiments. He looked up at the sky and firmly said, there's an observer in the sky that day. At that time, no one knew that in the sky that day, there was an observer called Sapan with hostile intentions, secretly watching humanity. Not long after the confirmation of macro-scale quantum effects, the research on ball lightning was forced to slow down. The research team discovered that electromagnetic fields could not only accelerate ball lightning but also interfere with and deflect it. This significantly reduced the upper-level expectations for the practical use of this weapon. However, Lin Yun remained steadfast in pushing forward with weapon research. 
she shifted the focus from targeting living organisms to weapon systems. For this purpose, the research team identified a particular kind of ball lightning capable of specifically destroying electronic chips, which was quite rare among the thousands of captured macroelectrons. Due to its rarity, it was referred to as the crown jewel on the ball lightning's crown. To regain the attention of the higher authorities and secure research funding, Colonel Su Wenqing decided to conduct an attack exercise using the collected ball lightning capable of destroying chips. At the testing base for Type 05 tanks, officers and generals from the General Armament Department and general staff smelled the odor of ozone, which was generated when the ball lightning struck the targets. The equipment used as targets was diverse, including communication devices on armored vehicles and 2000 series tanks, and even a retired anti-aircraft missile. Inside these targets, the chips had turned into ashes. Witnessing all of this, the military officers were exhilarated, with one major general exclaiming, this is truly like taking the head of a general from the midst of 10,000 troops. However, Chen's computer was unfortunately affected by the ball lightning. The CPU and two 256 megabytes memory modules inside his computer were all burned to ashes. It was this minor loss that prompted Chen to think about the issue of defense against ball lightning weapons. He approached Lin Yun and Ding Yi for a discussion. As they walked down the small path beside the former animal testing warehouse, they heard the sound of sheep. However, the animal experiments had been discontinued for over two months, and there were no sheep in the vicinity. They opened the doors to the laboratory to investigate, but there was nothing inside. Not long after, a significant event occurred that put ball lightning to use. A newly constructed nuclear power plant, the largest in the world, was occupied by a terrorist organization named Eden. This organization, formerly a group of technology fugitives, harbored a deep hatred for technology, believing that modern science and technology were destroying humanity. Their goal was to destroy the nuclear power plant and expose the world to the ugly side of technology by using the radioactive materials inside. When Qian and Lin Yun arrived at the scene with the Dawn Light Special Forces, Eden had already taken a group of elementary school students hostage and planted explosives on the nuclear reactor. They made no demands but considered the nuclear power plant as an earthly ulcer, with the sole purpose of its destruction. Chin observed through the camera feed as a woman appeared to be explaining something to the terrified children. He initially thought she was their actual teacher, trying to comfort them. However, he soon realized that the woman was the leader of the Asian branch of the Eden organization. She had previously assassinated two Nobel laureates in North America and was ranked third on the international most wanted list. At this moment, Chen noticed that a young boy was already lying in a pool of blood. His skull had been crushed by the woman's gunstock. When Lin Yun connected via video call, offering to exchange herself for the children, her offer was refused. Eden had already attracted the attention of the entire world, and they could trigger the nuclear reactor explosion at any time. The situation prompted the on-site commander to inquire about the feasibility of using the ball lightning weapon. When he learned that it wouldn't be able to distinguish between children and terrorists as targets, he fell silent. It was Lin Yun who looked at him with a scorching gaze and said, Commander, now the situation is as clear as one plus one. After a moment, the dawn like unit, which was on the rooftop of the guesthouse across from the nuclear power plant, received the orders to attack. As the green canvas covers were lifted, the ball lightning machine guns, already prepared, pointed toward the nuclear plant. When Lin Yun quickly took one of the shooting positions, Chen saw a look of unhidden excitement in her eyes. It was as if a child had finally obtained their favorite toy. This sight sent chills down Chen's spine, and he seemed to hear the suppressed cries of the children, weaker and more pitiful than the cries of the sheep. Two rows of ball lightning flew out from the rooftop, heading toward the reactor. When the group of ball lightning entered the control room, the female Eden leader had a puzzled smile on her face. It was her last smile on Earth. With the explosion of the ball lightning, the connected camera feed disappeared. When Chen entered the reactor control room, the entire floor had turned into an enormous abstract artwork created by the ball lightning, depicting life and death. Most of the deceased were burned to a crisp, except for one small hand emerging from unscathed clothing. It belonged to a young girl. Lin Yun knelt down to pick up the little hand, while Chen, standing behind her, was petrified. The first counterterrorism operation using the ball lightning weapon was successful. But upon returning to the base, Chen submitted his resignation. Despite Ding Yi's counsel and Lin Yun's apologies, nothing could persuade Chen to stay. Chen couldn't bear to see ball lightning again. Confronted with his complex emotions for Lin Yun, he couldn't bring himself to recall their first meeting at the summit of Mount Tai or anticipate a future reunion. As they parted ways, Chen said to Lin Yun, Take good care of yourself. Because at that time, tensions between China and the United States had escalated significantly. Chen returned to the Thunderstorm Research Institute, where his former mentor, Gao Bo, criticized Chen's ideas as foolish. In Gao Bo's words, even a scalpel could be used to kill. After Gao Bo left, Chen fell into another bout of insomnia. It wasn't until he was alone in his quiet dorm room that he heard a dripping sound. Chen discovered that the laptop on his desk, 
which had its CPU and memory burned, had miraculously started working. He immediately called for Ding Yi's help. Ding Yi came to the dorm, dismantled the laptop, and found that its insides were indeed charred, and the screen had gone blank. Ding Yi explained that it was due to the quantum state. When they experienced resonance with the macroelectrons, each chip was transformed into a macro-quantum state. They existed simultaneously in two uncertain states, burned and unburned. When the laptop booted up, they were in the unburned state. However, after being dismantled and observed, the quantum state collapsed back to the burned state. Chin fell silent for a moment, and Dingy added that people were the same. Everyone who had died due to ball lightning was like Schrodinger's cat, existing simultaneously in the states of life and death and uncertainty. However, people could never see them because their collapsed state was death. They could only exist in some probability in the quantum state. But as soon as people appeared as observers, they instantly collapsed into the state of destruction, into their urns or graves. Ding Yi's words made Chin feel that those lost lives might be right beside him. However, these new insights into quantum physics were no longer relevant to him. He was determined to find a new direction, one that would benefit life and must not be used for military purposes, such as tornado forecasting. With the optical system to detect macroelectrons and a mathematical model of tornado formation, Shin succeeded in observing potential atmospheric disturbances that could lead to tornadoes. In recognition of this achievement, Shin was nominated for the International Meteorological Organization IMO, award and invited to attend a seminar in the United States. The conference was held in the famous Tornado Alley in Oklahoma, and Shin was hosted by Dr. Ross. After observing a missile defense system called Tornado Hunter, which incorporated Chen's optical detection system as a key technology for locating the eye of a tornado, he was awarded the title of honorary citizen in the state's capital. Dr. Ross showed respect for Chin because the core of the Tornado Hunter system was, in essence, a theater missile defense system. Dr. Ross had simply modified the part that identified incoming missiles to locate the tornado's eye. It was his efforts that allowed Chen's vision of using technology to benefit humanity to come true. Before parting ways, Dr. Ross told Chen something with profound meaning. Swords can be forged into plowshares, but some plowshares can be forged into swords. At that time, Chin didn't fully grasp the significance of those words. Ten days later, he came to understand their meaning because the war between China and the United States had erupted. Chin received a call from the military inviting him to the Naval Operations Center. Here, military personnel showed Chin a live combat footage of the Pearl Peak Sea battle. The enemy's attack began with over 40 missiles, but to their surprise, all the missiles detonated outside the Pearl Peak's defense perimeter, dispersing a large amount of white powder. Subsequently, the enemy launched high-power lasers into the area, seemingly to detect submarines, but in reality, the white powder acted as a highly efficient coolant. Under the influence of the lasers, the area around the explosion points rapidly formed an ultra-low temperature zone. Chin watched the footage as if struck by lightning and shouted, Quick, have the fleet evacuate that area! However, the Navy Rear Admiral replied, Dr. Chin, this is a recording. The incident happened yesterday. Chin was almost overwhelmed because he knew that the core of a tornado was a descending cold air mass. By preventing it from descending through heating, tornadoes could be prevented from forming. On the contrary, if it was strengthened through cooling, it would promote the development of tornadoes. The key technology in this was to detect these potential tornado eyes, and Chen's forecasting system provided this possibility. More frighteningly, the system could detect adjacent eyes, and by catalyzing them simultaneously, it could spawn super tornadoes that didn't exist in nature. The next footage Chen saw was taken on the Pearl Peak. Three tornadoes appeared around the ship. Captain Lin Yun, the fiancé of Lin Yun, ordered the two pressurized water reactors to be sealed off at level A, which minimized the risk of a potential nuclear leak but also rendered the Pearl Peak powerless. Ultimately, the main deck of the Pearl Peak broke, and it sank within half an hour. Over 2,000 officers and soldiers, including Captain Lin Yun, perished. The last Navy Rear Admiral said that it was DR. Chen's tornado forecasting technology that helped the enemy discover the eye of the tornado in the atmosphere above the Pearl Peak. After leaving the Naval Operations Center in a daze, Chen finally understood Lin Yun. Attempting to contact her by phone but receiving no response, Chen returned to the Thunder Research Institute. With intense work, he forced himself to forget his past. However, one afternoon, the Research Institute experienced an unimaginable attack on its computer chips. At that time, Chin was discussing the technical details of using microwave technology to eliminate tornadoes with several military engineers. Suddenly, there were loud popping sounds all around, and many small fragments flew out of the intact computers, with each fragment being a complete CPU, memory chip, or other chip. At the same time, white smoke emerged from everyone's phones. The office was filled with the strange smell of chips burnt to white ash. Shortly thereafter, the power went out. They later learned that, with a certain location in northwest China as the epicenter, one-third of China's territory had suffered ship damage. The damage decreased gradually as it moved away from the epicenter, 
and those areas would experience long periods without electricity. Among various rumors about this disaster, during the enemy's observation period of the ceasefire, Dingyi found Chen and revealed the root cause of this disaster. It turned out that after Chen left the base, all information about Lin Yun became available. First, although the anti-terrorism operation at the nuclear power plant achieved certain results, the spherical lightning weapon still did not receive the attention of the higher-ups. It wasn't until the enemy destroyed the Pearl Peak with another new concept weapon that the enemy's carrier battle group penetrated China's nearby waters. Only then were the morning light forces allowed to conduct a tentative attack. In the operational meeting at the South China Sea Fleet Command Headquarters, the Deputy Chief of Staff first introduced the strategic intent. The plan was to use spherical lightning weapons to disrupt the enemy's missile defense system's electronic equipment, rendering it useless. This would provide an opportunity for China's land-based anti-missile systems. However, due to the limitations of the spherical lightning weapon, such as its inability to engage beyond the line of sight, a lack of air-launched versions, and other shortcomings, it could only be brought close to the enemy's vessels. The only feasible tool for this operation was a fishing boat. This meant that if anything went wrong, the soldiers on the boat would have no chance to escape. Despite these shortcomings, the so-called only viable option, the fishing boat plan, received approval at the meeting. In the early morning mist, 50 fishing boats were docked in the harbor, and soldiers in disguise were fully prepared. At this moment, Lin Yun arrived and requested that everyone change into military uniforms, then wear the disguises over them. This was because only combat personnel dressed in their country's military uniform would be entitled to the rights of prisoners of war under the Geneva Conventions. Lin Yun's actions in that moment revealed her compassionate side. When the U.S. Stennis Battle Group penetrated the ambush range, Colonel Kong Ming issued the firing order. The soldiers decisively activated their weapons, and amid a deafening explosion, a series of red glowing lightning balls streaked over the sea towards their targets. However, just as the first batch of spherical lightning reached the targets, they suddenly deviated from their trajectory. Some of the spherical lightning projectiles shot upward into the sky, while others dropped into the sea. It was as if each warship had a massive protective shield. It turned out these were magnetic field shields. Colonel Kong Ming ordered the ceasefire and weapon destruction. All the soldiers pressed the self-destruct buttons on their machine guns and pushed the machine guns into the sea. With the muffled explosion of the superconductor batteries sinking underwater, the enemy warship's naval guns also began a heavy barrage. Three minutes later, the shelling stopped. Out of the 50 fishing boats, 42 had been sunk, and the remaining eight were locked in the searchlight's circle. The secrecy of the spherical lightning weapon had long been compromised, such as its appearance during the terrorist attack and various drills. This sea ambush, which had placed all their hopes, had ultimately failed. This made Lin Yun even more fragile and desperate, to the point where she considered using spherical lightning to turn herself into a quantum state and attack the enemy ships. However, when she learned from Dingyi that as a quantum state, she would turn into a probabilistic cloud with almost zero chance of appearing on the enemy ship, her spirit nearly collapsed. But soon after, a new discovery reignited her hope. Because the sea ambush had failed, research on spherical lightning weapons had stopped. At this time, Zhang Bin also passed away from cancer. According to his wishes, Zhang Bin's body was cremated using spherical lightning. Because they had missed the funeral, Dingyi invited Lin Yun to visit Zhang Bin's grave. However, at the grave, they saw that the tombstone was covered with numerous small words. Lin Yun recognized that the handwriting on the tombstone was that of Zhang Bin's wife, Zheng Min Dingyi, on the other hand, found that the words described the mathematical model of macroatoms, with the last sentence written prominently. Bin, the speed at which F is induced is only 426.831 meters per second, and I'm so afraid. Dingyi told Lin Yun that this mathematical model was primarily used to accurately locate the precise position of macroatoms by observing the motion of macroelectrons. The method of detection was as simple as that of macroelectrons since the macroatom nucleus was a visible string. It was a string about 1 to 2 meters long with no end in sight. Every point on it was a singularity without a size. Just like macroelectrons, it could also bend light making it visible to the naked eye. After listening to Ding Yi's explanation, Lin Yun questioned whether the deceased Jing Min indeed had the ability to discover these truths. Ding Yi replied, If humanity lived in a world without friction, Newton's three laws might have been discovered earlier by more ordinary people. When she herself had become a quantum state macro particle, understanding that world would be much easier than for us. At this point, the research achieved a breakthrough, and the base quickly captured a large number of macro nuclei. However, at this time, Lin Yun still didn't know where this material was used until one day when she suggested attaching two strings to the same electromagnetic coil on a returning airship to save the electromagnetic coil used to adsorb the strings. This proposal was met with a loud rebuke from Ding Yi, who questioned Lin Yun about what would happen if two nuclei were entangled together in our world. After a moment of contemplation, Lin Yun suddenly displayed great excitement as if she had found a treasure and exclaimed, You mean nuclear fusion? 
String entanglement could release energy equivalent to a hundred thousand times that of spherical lightning. This was macrofusion. The conditions for macrofusion were the relative collision velocity of the two strings, and it only needed to be 426.83 meters per second. It was evident that Lin Yun understood everything Dingyi had said, as she had already decided to return to the base immediately to establish the collision acceleration rail needed for macrofusion. The discovery of macronuclei renewed the importance of the spherical lightning weapon project. Soon, the base was relocated from the outskirts of Beijing to the far northwest. An important meeting was held under the guidance of Lin Yun's father, during which many high-ranking leaders heard Ding Yi's report on the energy range of macrofusion and target selectivity. The acceleration rail for the strings had already been constructed. However, the following day, a special leadership group visited the base, led by Major General Di Luan. The first piece of news he brought was related to Lin Yun. Due to the fact that Lin Yun had transferred the weapons to both Chile and Bolivia in the liquid landmine incident, she was to be subjected to an isolated investigation. Finally, Major General Di Yuluin announced a superior order to immediately halt the research on macrofusion and macronuclei. The special leadership group would take over the base, and the spherical lightning research group would be completely withdrawn, awaiting further orders. After two failed attempts to make a final plea, Lin Yun remained silent. Her fiery and passionate gaze gradually turned into calm waters, and a while later, Lin Yun requested to go to the experimental bridge to retrieve her personal belongings under General Du's supervision. Then, under the supervision of a lieutenant colonel, Lin Yun turned and walked toward the large tent. Her figure disappeared into the blood-red sunset on the vast Gobi Desert. As the curtains of macrofusion were slowly drawn, the grand drama was set to begin. Although the research on the strings had been temporarily halted, General Du was still discussing the application range of spherical lightning weapons with Colonel Su during a meeting. According to a report submitted by the base, dissipative spherical lightning released electromagnetic radiation that covered almost all communication bands, allowing for full-spectrum jamming interference against the enemy. Dingy interjected. This plan was also proposed by Lin Yun. Upon hearing this, everyone fell silent. Suddenly, gunshots were heard coming from the direction of the fusion point, breaking the silence. The people at the meeting immediately turned on their cameras to see a man running towards the meeting room from the fusion point. The person was the lieutenant colonel who had accompanied Lin Yun. He had been shot in the shoulder but rushed inside and said, Lieutenant Lin Yun is attempting to forcibly initiate a macrofusion test. In total, there were six people at the macrofusion test point, three lieutenants and two captains who chose to follow Lin Yun. Soon, the guard forces surrounded the fusion point. Colonel Su used a loudspeaker to try and persuade them, but the reply was a row of cold blue spherical lightning that shot out of the fusion point. They emerged from the tent, turning several red willow trees and piles of wooden crates on the barren sands into ashes. From the tent, Lin Yun's voice rang out. This is your only warning. Facing this situation, General Du ordered the withdrawal of the guard forces and immediately contacted General Lin Feng to report the situation. There was a two-second silence on the other end of the phone before General Lin Feng said, Does this require consultation? You have been relieved of duty. Hand the phone to Colonel Shu Jian. Colonel Shu Jian took the phone and immediately heard General Lin Feng's decisive command. Deploy tactical missiles to destroy the fusion point. This is an order. People soon saw the missile with a white trail streaking across the southern sky. Just then, from the loudspeaker inside the tent, Lin Yun's voice could be heard saying, Dad, you're too late. Macrofusion was silent, but the tent first emitted blue light, making it transparent, and then the tent began to converge toward the fusion point until it was sucked into the blue sphere. After the tent disappeared, the blue sphere continued to expand rapidly and soon took on the appearance of a blue sun on the barren sands. Within its 200-meter radius, immense energy would annihilate everything. A spectacle then unfolded. Inside the deep interior of the blue sun, numerous bright little stars radiated outward. These were the tents, the quantum superposition state of the tents. In the eyes of the observers, these tents collapsed rapidly into the state of destruction. The probability cloud of a tent diffused into the sky in silence. Finally, a faint crackling sound broke the silence. It was the sound of electronic chips detonating. Following that, a loud explosion was heard from the sky. It was the incoming missile. When all the chips inside it were destroyed, it first spiraled and then exploded in midair. Afterward, the blue sun began to shrink rapidly and ultimately disappeared near the Earth's surface. A minute earlier, two macroatoms had collided at a relative speed of 500 meters per second in the unimaginably vast macro-universe, and two hydrogen atoms disappeared. A new atom was born, so tiny that it was impossible for any observer in the macro-world to perceive it. Under the glow of the setting sun, people arrived at the fusion point. The tent and everything inside it had vanished without a trace. In its place was a large mirror lying flat on the barren sands. It had formed from the momentary melting and solidification of the sand and stone surface. The mirror was incredibly smooth and reflected the beautiful sunset in the western sky. 
At the same time, the surging energy from macrofusion spread outward for more than a thousand kilometers, annihilating all the chips in one-third of the country's territory. On the third day after the macrofusion event, General Lin Feng, Lin Yun's father, arrived at the fusion point. When the weary General Lin Feng reached the edge of the mirror, Lin Yun appeared. She walked toward her father from the other end of the giant mirror, as if walking on the clouds. She approached her father and began to recount her entire life. Dad, do you remember that night on the mid-autumn festival? I was the only child left in the military kindergarten, waiting for my mother at the courtyard gate, but she never came because she sacrificed herself in the war. That night was a turning point in my life. My previous loneliness and sadness suddenly turned into hatred. In second grade, you brought me to the military to take care of me. I saw guns, hand grenades, and even flamethrowers for the first time. It was then that I fell in love with weapons. Despite being young, my marksmanship was better than that of the soldiers. You finally realized the severity of the problem and scolded the soldier who taught me how to shoot. You took me home to learn music, art, and literature, trying to nurture a sense of beauty in me as a normal girl. But it was too late. The new knowledge that shaped my mind only deepened my appreciation for the beauty of weapons. After entering high school, our communication became less and less frequent. Later, someone had a significant influence on my life, but I never told you about it. It was a Russian woman I met on a weapons forum when I was studying for my master's degree. She was a highly qualified weapons expert, and based on our shared interests, we established a long-term connection. Later, during a trip to Vietnam for inspection, she invited me and told me about her role in developing a new conceptual weapon for the Soviet Union. After the Cold War, she separated from her husband due to her patriotic beliefs and the tragic overdose of her drug-addicted daughter in the United States. At that moment, I felt that if my mother were alive, she might be just like her. From then on, we had a sense of attachment to each other. Until that one time, when Chin and I went to Siberia for an inspection, I went to visit her and saw a super low temperature liquid nitrogen storage tank. Inside it was the crystallization of her two decades of hard work. It was an attack on hornets, and it was under her leadership that genetic technology created these evil spirits, which were sent to the front lines of the old socialist battlefields in China and Vietnam. Dad, you must find it ironic, right? The person I considered a surrogate mother turned out to be the executioner who indirectly killed my mother. Knowing these truths, I stormed out of her apartment despite her following me and asking if she had done something wrong. At that moment, I felt the world was so grim. After returning to China, I received a farewell email from her. At the end of the letter, she gave me a piece of advice, that all the forces of nature, including those that people consider the gentlest and most harmless, could become weapons of destruction one day. Those terrible things might fall on your compatriots and loved ones, or even on the tender skin of babies in your arms. The best way to prevent this is to create them ahead of your enemies. This was how Lin Yun revealed her deeply hidden inner world, and at that moment, the setting sun cast a golden glow on everyone at the barren sands. In the final moments of the father-daughter conversation, General Lin Feng asked his daughter to remove the epaulets and collar insignias from her military uniform. Lin Yun reached for her epaulets, and as the trace of her hand disappeared, Lin Yun's body began to turn transparent, as if she were a crystalline shadow on a mirror. Lin Yun, in a quantum state, disappeared. Ding Yi's recollection finally came to an end, and he ultimately explained to Qin why Lin Yun appeared in front of everyone without collapsing. The significant difference between a quantum individual, as a conscious entity, and ordinary unconscious quantum particles is that people often overlook one observer, themselves. This self-observation can counteract other observers and maintain the quantum state of a person without collapsing. The complex nature, instability, and durability of this self-observation process are beyond the comprehension of humans in the real world. At this moment, the noise from outside the window interrupted Chen and Ding Yi's conversation. The jubilant crowd was celebrating the end of the war, thanks to Lin Yun's initiation of macrofusion, which established a powerful deterrent to the enemy. Due to the way macrofusion's energy was reduced through the destruction of its targets, it meant that even if a macrofusion event occurred at the same fusion point as before, the impact range would expand until the energy was exhausted. This level of power was sufficient to restore the entire Earth to an agricultural age and more technologically advanced countries would suffer even greater consequences. As Chin joined the cheering crowd outside, a woman rushed up to hug him. When they separated, both were left in astonishment. The woman was Dai Lin, whom Chin had met in the university library many years ago. The war had made people cherish things they had taken for granted, and two months later, Chin and Dai Lin got married. A year after that, they had their own child, and their life was peaceful and serene. However, one day, an American visitor disrupted their tranquility. This visitor was Norton Park, the project director whom Lin Yun had previously hacked. He informed Chen that they had conducted secret experiments in underground mines using the collapsed conditions of spherical lightning to search for extraterrestrial life. Shockingly, they found a stable collapsed state of spherical lightning even when there were no observers, suggesting the existence of a super-observer, possibly an extraterrestrial being. 
At that time, humanity was still unaware of the existence of the Trisolar and Sophons. Chun, filled with curiosity, went to visit Ding Yi, but he encountered his cohabiting dance actress lover. She questioned Chin about whether Ding Yi had other lovers because he wiped a picture of a female teacher every day. When Chin examined the photo, he realized why the girl referred to it as a female teacher. The picture featured Lin Yun, along with a group of children, in front of the animal experimentation warehouse. They all had bright smiles, especially the little girl with one arm less. After that, Chen never asked Ding Yi about the photo, as it was a deep secret hidden within his heart. However, Chen had his own secret. One late autumn midnight, while working at his desk, Chen suddenly smelled a pleasant fragrance. When he looked at the flower vase on his desk, he noticed a blue rose that had appeared, only to vanish in an instant. Since then, Chen began filling the vase with water daily, even though there were no flowers. When Dylan saw the vase filled with clear water, she bought a bouquet of fresh flowers to place in it. However, Chen stopped her, insisting that there was already a flower in the vase, a blue rose. Dylan considered it a peculiar behavior and suspected that Chen was hiding someone deep inside. Their relationship started to show cracks. Then one clear morning, their child, who was unaware of the discord between Chen and Dylan, suddenly told Dylan that there was a blue rose in the flower vase on the writing desk. Dylan was initially alarmed, but two days later, she also smelled the fragrance of a rose. Since then, she occasionally wiped the vase, but they never saw that blue rose again. Whenever Chen inadvertently caught the scent of the flower, he recalled Ding Yi's words. When he became a weak observer, the probability cloud of the rose would collapse more slowly, giving hope that he might see it again. Perhaps that moment would come when Chin, nearing the end of his life, opened his eyes one last time, and the quantum rose smiled at him once more.